Good afternoon, everyone from Chicago, Illinois. I am Lucy Gray, and I am the co-founder of the Global Education Conference, along with Steve Hargadon. And we're thrilled today to bring you um, Karen, Karen, and Kevin. Uh, Karen Blumberg from New York City. She is a tech coordinator at the Burley School. Uh, Karen Kirsch-Page, who also is in New York, and she's the founder of K-12 Productions and EdTech Summit Africa. And then we have Kevin, <coughs> um, and I hope I'm saying your name correctly, Beloy. How, I, how should I say your name, Kevin? Beloy. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm terrible with names, so excuse, pardon me for that um, that terrible pronunciation on, on my part. But we're so happy to have you here because um, I've been following uh, Karen Blumberg uh, on Instagram and Twitter and everything for years, and uh, and she had an amazing adventure with you guys last summer, and I can't wait to hear the story behind that. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I met Karen Blumberg uh, uh, 10 years ago, I think, almost, um, when I came to visit her previous school, uh, the school at Columbia, um, which was a very innovative school at the time, and, and uh, was introduced to her and Andrew Gardner and Don Buckley. And the three of these people have become, um, you know, some of my closest ed tech friends, and, and I admire them so greatly for the work that they're doing pushing the envelope. Um, Karen Blumberg, who I know the best of the three here, uh, is very prolific on social media and sets a great example for everyone. So if you're not following her on Twitter and that sort of thing, you should. And um, and right now, Karen is in a, in a new school. She's at the Brearley School in New York, and they're in the middle of a fire drill. So she's coming. And if you don't have fire drills where you are, it's usually a monthly event in every school here That's in the true. U.S. Um, yeah. And um, I'm so shy. Um, thank you so much. Can you even hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. We're talking about you. Uh, I'm going to just log off for now. Okay. Come back when you can. So Karen, Karen, and Kevin have been, um, you know, um, preparing for this keynote. And of course, uh, a fire drill has to happen in the middle of it. I think it will go down in, uh, in conference I really history. I really appreciate so, it. It's super um, gracious. Okay, I'll be back. Okay, come back when you can talk. And I'm going to turn this over uh, to Karen um, Page. Is that okay, Karen, if you take it from here? Oh, we need to do the our typical, sorry, thank our sponsors first. Um, and we really want to uh, give a shout out to VIF International Education, Google, Tez, Iron, and uh, the host of other people who have supported us throughout the years. Um, I also want to take a second to make sure everybody has heard about our Chrome Warrior setup. It is a gamified PD experience so that you can get um, a certificate for attending the conference. So if you go to uh, gec.chromewarrior.net, you can sign up to play our game, and uh, Julia from Chrome Warrior will be approving your achievements and so on and so forth. So this could be one of your activities of viewing a keynote speaker uh, session uh, for the GEC and that sort of thing. So I want to make sure you guys all know about that. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm going to give everybody whiteboard permissions, and I'd like you to take the tools to the left of the whiteboard and, and click on um, the star kind of icon and then on the map to show us where you are in the world. And then you can tell us in, um, uh, in the chat specifically where you are. And generally we ask people to say what the weather's like so we can get a comparison around the room too. So we'll give you a minute here to take the whiteboard uh, tools to the left and click on the star and uh, uh, and indicate where you are in the map. So it looks like we've got lots of U.S. people here right now. Um, I'm outside Chicago where it is now overcast and chilly. It's autumn here. We've got Madeline in British Columbia. We've got somebody in L.A., St. Louis. That's great. Okay, so click on, if you want to add where you are on the map, you click on the little star to the left of the whiteboard, and then you click on your location on the map. And Kevin is in South Africa where it is evening, my understanding. 
And uh, we appreciate you joining us, Kevin, even though it's probably been a long day for you. All right. Anyone else going to add themselves to the map? Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to turn off the whiteboard permissions, and then without further ado, I am going to turn this over to um, Karen Kirsch-Page, and she can tell you a little bit more about her work and how she's organized the summit in Africa. Um, I think it's pretty exciting. So over to you, Karen. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Lucy and, and Steve and everyone behind the scenes for making this possible. And, and um, especially thank you to the participants who are joining uh, to be with us in conversation from around the world. Um, my name is Karen Kirsch-Page. My company is K2 Productions Global. And my nickname may be to make it easy for you since we have two Karens on our uh, team here as moderators um, is to call me K2, which is a nickname. So for those of you in the chat room and anyone asking a question, if you want to direct it to myself, uh, go ahead and use the letter K number two. And then Karen Blumberg will go by Karen, and Kevin Beloy will go by Kevin, and we are definitely three Ks. Um, so to explain a little bit about how our, our session will go today, um, I'll start and give a little bit of the history of EdTech Summit Africa and how it was founded, why it was founded, what we hope to do, and in particular what 2016 did. Uh, Karen will come in next and talk a little bit about um, her role as a presenter from the U.S. on the global presentation team. Um, we are a volunteer team, and so she joined us this year. And then Kevin will finish up by talking a little bit about being a volunteer from the South African, from the African side, from South Africa, and uh, a little bit of his um, sort of background knowledge of context. So that's, then we'll save hopefully the last 10, 15 minutes for, for questions. Uh, meanwhile, we'll watch the chat room. Um, so we see that you guys are from all over, and I'm figuring that you are here because you're interested in education and interested in figuring out how you can deepen your effect on education. And um, I think that most of us are in this together trying to find ways that we can we can really move things for students, for teachers, for both formal learning and informal learning. Um, my own background is <laughs> from really the music business as a, an ambassador of sorts, traveling around the world with jazz and rock and hip hop groups. Uh, my undergrad degree was as a sound engineer, and that sort of whet my appetite um, seeing the world and realizing that there are a lot of people out there who, uh, just by meeting each other culturally, um, learn and grow. So fast forward a number of years to where I landed in a school in San Francisco, a very, very um, high-functioning, wonderful school called Town School for Boys. Some of you may know of it. Um, but they supported technology growth and especially teachers that worked at town uh, experimenting and coming to find their own technology strategies and learning strategies, best practices around the integration of technology. Um, after working at town for 15 years or towards the end, I started working with an organization called Teach with Africa. Teach with Africa is based in San Francisco and is committed to um, improving education worldwide through teaching exchange. And, and out of that being involved in Teach with Africa and working with a lot of students um, and teachers, uh, it, it, it came to me that um, a big missing piece in a lot of the communities that I worked in around the world um, was professional development for teachers, especially around technology, especially around open source and available and free and manageable, implementable technologies that could actually serve as a social justice lever, as an education equity strategy if, uh, if they could be embraced and brought into schools that really had very little 
in terms of technology. So I began to work with teachers and in South Africa. I was traveling back and forth um, and, and founded a conference. Um, I hope that this talk today is as much about inspiration of what some of us uh, can do just by raising our hand and volunteering and building on ideas that, that you know, we, uh, we learn from, from each other. Um, and you'll hear that from Karen Blumberg and Kevin Beloy uh, in what their participation has done. But for me, it was learning from teachers in uh, South Africa at first and uh, building, building a conference with them in order to provide free training. So EdTech is something that could happen anywhere. And I hope it could serve as a conference model. Um, certainly, if people have ideas on other continents and other countries and want to contact me, um, I'm all about sharing. So I throw that out there in hopes that some of you uh, think that it might be possible where you are to create some training opportunities uh, where teachers have a whole lot of fun and they come in very low risk, low stakes um, learning environments and, and really go back to their own contexts with a lot of ideas and a lot of confidence, maybe just from a one day conference. Um, so EdTech Summit began in 2013 with just two locations and um, approximately 600 attendees in two schools, really in partnership um, with the LEAP schools. And let me push forward and show you um, just a little bit about, while I'm talking, a little bit about who we are, although this can be found on the website as well. Um, we started with 600 in just two schools in two and a half days, and we kept improving on the model to, in 2014, we had 900 attendees um, in, in five locations, 2015, nine locations, 1,200, and 10 locations in 2016 with almost 2,000 attendees. Now, these numbers aren't huge, and you may say, well, I really want to scale this, and those don't sound like the kind of numbers that are making changes in in large education systems. But in fact, we teach like we want educators to model uh, with their students. We bring in hands-on, one-to-one device uh, learning opportunities where people are learning in classrooms of 25, adults are learning together, and they have a chance to use devices oftentimes for the first time ever. Um, and and we marshal giveaways. We try and give away through random um, giveaway and, and social media at every conference, either tablets or, or laptops. We had 50 Dell laptops donated the first year. Um, we've had iPads and Chromebooks either donated or given to our budget at very low cost. Um, after the first few years, we started a professional learning network to keep the learning going during the year in between conferences, and we open that up to any attendees. Uh, we keep it limited to attendees because they have the foundation for learning in our conference, and we feel that that sort of builds appropriately, uh, but we keep adding to it every year. I will say that as someone who's in the middle of getting her doctorate in adult learning and leadership at, at Teachers College, Columbia University, I have begun to um, push in learning theory um, everywhere that I can that makes sense. And so understanding the way adults learn, which is very, very different than kids, uh, the barriers that adults come with, um, we pay attention to that in order to deepen the learning. And um, I think it's really worked. Um, I'll sort of, uh, I mean, I've, I'm sure I've left lots of, of questions that you may have. Um, I do want to say that um, EdTech Summit could not have 
occurred and grown over the years without a lot of key people who are not on this this uh, uh, conference panel today. Um, and and that's okay. Um, they know who they are. They have um, been involved willingly and organizations have been involved willingly in order to help this grow. Uh, but I'd like to mention Teach with Africa and the LEAP Science and Math Schools in South Africa. I'd like to mention Siobhan Thatcher um, and all of the co-producers over the years, Mona Ewes and Wendy Cross and Josh Elder and people who are, you know, giving of their time over and above 40-hour weeks to be involved and volunteer. Some of our partners are here in the slide deck, which you guys can look at later. We're beginning to partner with uh, Departments of Education, and we also had three universities serve as host campuses for us this year. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about the host campuses. Um, they're all schools who offer their facilities as part of their social responsibility. Um, I'm going to sort of jump through a few um, slides on the way to um, Karen joining us, but you can see that um, People fill rooms and jump on devices, cross-platform, um, meet a global team of presenters. We are half African, half from the US and Europe, uh, traveling together. Um, and um, because we're global voices, we feel people learn. Um, their ears are open to ideas, and we bring um, certainly ideas that our attendees share with us back into the conference. We iterate, we, we improve, um, and we involve people. So um, our giveaways uh, make a big difference to teachers. Oftentimes they can't try things that they've learned at a conference. Um, so we make that a big part of our mission. It sometimes um, is, ranges from camera equipment to laser pointers to teaching tools to, uh, to tablets. Um, and um, people have a lot of fun learning at EdTech Summit, and they have a lot of fun jumping in and presenting uh, and traveling together and staying in B&Bs and in our days off seeing cultural sites. Um, so I think um, uh, my last slide here, or second to last slide, is going to sort of show you these are two teachers in one of my workshops. I did a workshop on reimagining adult learning where I talked about MOOCs and free resources and ways for teachers to keep growing uh, through YouTube, through the use of Twitter, through cultivating communities and PLCs. And um, uh, out of 10 conferences, uh, not too many people had heard of, of MOOCs or free opportunities. So we're working on connectivity. That's a big one. Uh, but I'm going to let uh, Karen uh, jump in if she's back from the from the fire drill, and hopefully give you yeah. another perspective. And then I'll be on uh, uh, I'll be on to answer some questions. And so thank you guys for listening. Yeah, Karen, thanks. Thank you, K2, and thank you, Lucy and Steve, for introducing us and for inviting us to participate in this seventh annual Global Education Conference. It's such an important mission, and you do this generously. Um, and willingly <laughs> for like the seventh year now, and so many initiatives in between, by the way. Um, like there's the Global Education Day, and there's the event that happens uh, at ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education. They have an annual conference every year. So it's a really big deal that um, Lucy and, and Steve reached out and invited us, and I'm super proud to be here, and I will try to remember to talk slowly. Hello. I'm having issues, maybe it's because of the fire drill, but if you're still there, that would be great. Um, essentially, this was my second time in Africa. My first time was in Morocco in like 2006, which was a totally crazy two-week adventure with this friend of mine from college. And I'd always wanted to go back and see more. And, and so this opportunity arose, and I jumped on it. Um, I... I was, I've been teaching for 21 years. Uh, I've been a technology integrator or coordinator for about 16 of those years. 
Most of them have been in independent schools in Manhattan. Um, I used to teach math, but then I ventured into technology. I attend and I organize so many events for teachers. Um, I go to um, all these meetups. I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly developing myself professionally. And then I kind of act as a filter and try and share to my network things that I've gathered. I'm not the only person that does this in my network. So I'm just part of a group of people who I respect and admire. And I try and use the term uh, professional generosity, which I learned from Lucy Gray, where if, you, if, you, if you're doing something because you learned about it from someone else, then credit them and, and thank them publicly so that people, you know, we model what it's like to be kind and to be courteous and professionally generous with each other. Um, so something that I hope that our new president and government can do, but I'm not going to go into politics, don't worry. Um, some of the events I organize are the Robo Expo, uh, where kids get together and they share their robotics learning. I've organized TEDx events, TEDx New York Education, and TEDx Youth at my previous school, the school at Columbia University. Um, I also organize EdCamp NYC. I'm passionate about EdCamp. I went to the first one in Philadelphia in May of 2010, and I knew that I could do it in New York City right away. And since then, I've, I've led or I've attended or I've peer pressured other people to organize EdCamp. Um, I led the first EdCamp in India, EdCamp Mumbai, and in March, I plan on launching the first EdCamp in Thailand, EdCamp Bangkok. So my point is, I love traveling, I love teaching, I love professional development, I love meeting other teachers and learning great things and then sharing those ideas further. So when I saw something come across uh, a news group from Karen Kirsch Page from K2 about this trip, I was so excited and I reached out to her and I'm, I was, it was a delight to be chosen. So here's a picture of um, us eating in Alex Alexandra, which, uh, in Alexandria, which is um, short, shortened as Alex. And this is where Kevin is from. So Kevin, when he joins the keynote um, discussion, this is, he took us around the area where he grew up. We had kotas, which I learned later was basically a quarter of a sandwich. <laughs> it was a quarter of a giant submarine roll. And I ate the entirety of it. And it was an awesome thing to just be somewhere and have someone else tell me, about their experience growing up and what he ate, and so I could share that experience. That's my favorite way to travel. Um, so anyway, uh, the beauty of EdCamp uh, Summit is that we got to work with teachers. Um, but in between working with teachers, we led 10, 10 summits in 30 days. We traveled. So I would like to think of it as volunteer tourism. Um, we also saw more sunrises during the month of July this past summer than I've seen possibly in the last decade. We were constantly waking up at like, 4.30, 5, 5.30 in the morning to either get in the car and drive to the next town or basically to get in the car and drive to the summit and set up in advance for the teachers. Um, and it turns out the sunrises are beautiful. I have not seen one since. <laughs> I'm back to waking up super late. Um, anyway, we saw, uh, we saw elephants on a game drive in Kruger National Park and on Robben Island, I saw Nelson Mandela's cell. I mean, these are once in a lifetime, hopefully not, maybe I'll, I'll get back there again. But these were such incredible, momentous experiences. And I thank Karen Kirsch Page, K2, and I thank her producer partner, uh, Mona Eways, um, for letting me join them. Um, this is a view of Cape Town. I, I hiked, again, we woke up before sunrise and got to the base of uh, Table, what is that, Table Mountain? in Cape Town, and I climbed. It took two hours to get up and two hours to get down, and this was the view, and it hurt for three days after that. Um, three days of hiking, um, and I'm 42 years old, mind you. So anyway, this was the amazing team of teachers that I traveled with. There were 12 of us in total, and again, for 30 days, <laughs> we were like on a tour, and in those 30 days, we led 10 summits for teachers, and the summits were a full day experience where we offered workshops and they chose from amongst three workshops to attend. Uh, I led a particular workshop about using Google Sites to develop a, a teaching portfolio. And so here are some slides from the workshop I led. I call it Our Portfolios Ourselves because I'm a child of the 70s. So if anyone remembers, there's that book, um, Our Bodies Ourselves. So I like the pun. And I shared about how these are things I repeat endlessly as a technologist in schools. Everything you do online is public and permanent and traceable. And I don't say public versus private. Rather, I say it's public versus less public. And I use this language with the teachers. I also use this language with teachers at home and with students and with parents and with administrators in schools. I beg, I implore kids to make wise choices. 
I talk about using technology academically, creatively, responsibly, and I talk about how we're a community and our technology use should reflect that community. Uh, I shared about what a portfolio could be for teachers. Um, it could be a place to record your achievements and reflect on your teaching and learning and support your applications for tenure and promotion. And I previously had kept a binder where I, I gathered all my resources, but, you know, uh, then it turned into a digital binder. And then Google Sites came out in, like, I don't know, 2009, 10. And I realized that if you could put all your stuff in a Google site, um, you could, it would be online. You could access it from anywhere. It could be edited endlessly. Um, you could link to multimedia artifacts um, and highlight your best work and keep track of your learning and learn about your learning in this metacognitive process and connect with others. I choose Google Sites um, because it's free and it's platform agnostic, meaning it doesn't matter if you're using Chrome browser or Firefox or Safari, or a PC, or a Chromebook, or an Apple, um, or, or a tablet, or a laptop. Um, there is a new Google site, and I haven't yet explored it, but it's supposed to be pretty good, um, although not as good, but I'm sure it'll be fine. I hope it'll be fine. Um, but the idea is it's web-based, and so because it's part of the Google suite of tools, you can, if you have a Google site, you can embed a Google slideshow, or a Google Doc, or a Google Calendar. So it ends up being a really great uh, pro productivity tool, I suppose. Um, I taught people about how they could think about how they organize their pages and choosing layouts and will it be a collaborative site or will it just be for them? Will it be public or less public? Um, and I taught the basics of like how to negotiate things uh, on the site, but I also talked about how to find information because I teach myself how to do things. Um, so I modeled for them what it looked like to Google answers to questions. So anytime they said, oh, I want to do this, how shall I do it? I said, oh, well, let's Google it. Um, I, I can't believe, like, this amazing array of workshops that our participants got to choose from. Uh, K2 led this great one about building a PLN, a, a personalized or a professional learning network. She showed about making a Facebook group and joining MOOCs, as she said before, and getting on Twitter and learning how to build a wider community that's not just, you know, physically local, but truly globally local. So you can reach out to teachers all over the world and share resources and share, you know, headaches or, or ask questions or ask for advice. It's so valuable to me. And I've been building my network for a long time. And I know that it's like the number one thing I bring to Brearley now is, is my ability to reach out and, and get answers or feedback or advice from other teachers around the world. Um, there's, uh, I learned from another, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm totally blank. Oh, yeah, so we had another one, uh, Ryan, who led a workshop on Scratch. And he, this is, I, I'm, by the way, I learned every day from the other teachers. So in Ryan's workshop, he asked people to build a game and he, in Scratch, and he asked them to consider who's the main character of your game and what do they fight for? So we're teaching kids to somehow, like, you know, have this social justice, social action, um, like, lens through which to build a game. Um, I, I am blank, and I fight for blank in, uh, in this location. So you got to fill in the blanks. Um, so I love that. He, I love that I learned from him a great intro activity to building a game in Scratch. Um, I learned from Anusha Hashim. She had the, she was doing an inquiry-based STEM activity. So they were building, she asked people to build bridges with straws and paper clips, which was so funny because she didn't give any instructions. Instead, she said, here's some materials, make me a bridge. So the idea is that um, people had to, they asked questions like, what kind of bridge? What should it look like? And she said, well, what's, what kind of bridges are there? She used their questions to guide the actual discussion. Um, it was inquiry-based. It was based on the inquiry, on the interest of the people in the room. It, it was fascinating, and I learned a lot from watching her. She also had this great way of um, walking around the room while groups tried to build their bridges, and she wrote uh, two columns on the board at the front. One column was titled, I see, and the other column was titled, I hear. So she was validating what the groups were doing, what the, what the participants were building, and how they were uh, collaborating with each other by noting things that she saw and things that she heard. I thought that was just such a wonderful thing, and I wrote about it on my blog, on my own portfolio, and I got to share out further what Anusha did, what, how this idea, this very simple idea of noting, I see, I hear. And I heard that from so many colleagues of mine who said, I love that idea, I'm going to use it, and I said, great, please give Anusha credit, because it's that idea I learned from her, so let's pay it forward, let's be professionally generous, 
and courteous, but also I had other people say, oh, I love that idea, and I'm also going to include a column for I feel. So it will be I see, I hear, I feel. And then I had an art teacher friend of mine who said, oh, I know. I'm not going to do the writing on the board. I'm going to ask a student to do it. So every class period, I'm going to ask a different student to, to list I see, I hear at the front. And I love that idea of sharing this, Anusha's, uh, this, 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 idea of hers, sharing it further, and then hearing back from other people that A, they appreciated it, but B, how would they change it? So that to me is like the best way of using my PLN, my professional learning network. Um, I learned this great uh, icebreaker from Tonda Kile, who basically she had people write down on a slip of paper something that challenges them. Uh, she was teaching a, a workshop on remedial education, and so something that the teacher found super challenging and they had to roll up the slip of paper, stick it in a balloon, blow up the balloon, and then play with the balloons in the middle, which is it's so funny to see grown-ups, you know, exhibiting playful behavior. Like, they, some of them were shy at first, but then they started tossing the balloons around. Then you end up, she says stop, and you land with someone else's balloon is in your hand. And what you do is you pop the balloon and read the slip of paper, which then launches a discussion because people are now trying to solve each other's problems. You read a slip of paper that was written by someone else in the room, so now other people feel a little more comfortable reading it out loud, sharing this problem, and finding a solution together as a group. So I shared her idea, and again, all these people wrote back, and we're like, what a great idea. I'm going to use that at my next faculty meeting, or I'm going to use that with my students. Um, there's also Claudia Sanfield, who has a beach ball. And she writes questions on each segment of the beach ball, and then when she tosses the ball to someone, whichever segment their thumb touches is the question that uh, gets asked out loud, and then the group ends up responding to that question. So I think that beach ball happened to be on, like, uh, what's something that you find challenging about integrating technology? Um, so basically, all these things I learned just because I, was, I got to be part of this trip, and I felt... It was so nice to be able to impart knowledge, but also be able to receive knowledge. And I love learning from and with teachers. It's my favorite thing. Um, this was at our last workshop, at our last summit in Ghana. And it turned out that the three of us are, are from Teachers College, Columbia University. So I travel around the world, and I take a picture. Um, and the three of us all had totally different experiences at Columbia, but we all ended up taking this, being part of the same program. Um, so, again, this, this experience, all it did was prove to me that the world is smaller. It gave me an opportunity to learn uh, from other people, both from South Africa and from America, and it gave me an opportunity to make some connections that I hope will be super long-lasting. Um, here's, I think, one final picture. Oh, there are two final pictures. This one is every single summit we attended, we gave out devices, K2 got like 120 iPads, and we were able to use them at each summit for their participants, and then we gave them out to people. They were raffled off. And so the excitement, the ability to change someone's life by giving them a device and then enabling them to use that device to grow professionally or to just play on, I guess, but also to bring to their classroom. So many times on this trip I heard, I've never touched an iPad before. I even heard, I've never touched a mouse before. And I also heard, I've never used a computer before. Um, so it was, it was remarkable. A lot of people relied on their data connection. So one of the sponsors of EdTech Summit Africa is Project Azizway, and they're trying to put in Wi-Fi uh, around the country. So that's powerful because in New York City, the city is trying to do that too with this Link NYC program. I'm so sorry. Okay, thanks. And then finally, I just wanted to point out that at this, also at that Ghana summit, here were three generations of the same family working together. So that's the grandmother holding her granddaughter while her daughter also learns. So that to me was one of the most powerful pictures I snapped on this, in the 30-day trip. I, I couldn't believe how meaningful it was to see women learning together. Um, and then this is just what it felt like at the end of one of my sessions. So I'm going to turn it over to Kevin, and I appreciate your patience. Hi everyone. Um, before I can start, I just want to make sure that um, everyone hears me. Can everyone hear me? No. Awesome. Um, so, um, firstly, I'd like to thank um, to take this opportunity to thank the Global um, Meditation Conference for this opportunity. Um, my name is Kevin, and I'm a student teacher um, in South Africa. 
So I will talk briefly about the history of education in South Africa and how it affected our grandparents. I will also touch base on the new system and how I, as a young teacher, I aspire to make a difference in South Africa um, in the education system. Um, so basically, in 1953, the government passed the Bantu Education Act, which was the South African segregation law, which legalized um, several aspects of the apartheid system. Um, its major provision was enforcing racially separated educational um, facilities, which the people didn't want. They didn't want this bad education for their children. So the Bantu Education Act was to make sure that um, our children only learned things that would make them good for what the government wanted um, to work in factories and so on. So um, they must not learn properly at school, like um, children of color. Um, children were to go to school only three hours a day, two shifts of students every day. So like very why they did that was because um, they wanted the children like to, to go to work after school. So they only had time to, to learn for like three hours and after that for the rest of the day they go um to work. So the South Africa so called bone tree generation now accounts for some forty percent of the population um born since the country's first fully democratic elections in nineteen ninety four. Um they have grown up without apartheid and the struggle of South Africa's older generation. So basically the one free generation is the generation that um, was born like from 1994 up until today, um, where we learn in English no longer um, learning in Afrikaans and so on. So I am the offspring of South Africa's current generation of domestic and guardian workers, my neighbors, security guards, waitresses, and patients. We are commonly referred to as born priests, children who have grown up um, post apartheid. Our parents went for our parents went to free us um, from harsh social economic conditions that were victims to nurturing hopes of better future for us through higher education. Having made it through university, a moment that makes me feel like um, a proud war veteran. I believe that the struggle my, uh, my generation faces is not only lack of access to higher education, but even more lack of knowledge on how to get educated. Um, so the EdTech Summit is a platform where educators experience first-hand training because we don't only show them how certain tools work, but we also let them practice on their own. We give them devices to to play on, to use online to to use online tools on our watch, and then we assist them where they need assistance. So the first time when I heard about the EdTech Summit was in 2013, and I attended the workshop as a curious student teacher. And I didn't know the purpose of the summit thing because I heard it from a colleague via a um, word of mouth and he didn't give me uh, much information about the, the summit. But I attended the summit because I'm passionate about education and technology. So I just wanted to see what was in store for me. Um, so this year I was lucky enough to be part of the summit as a presenter. Um, being the youngest presenter in the EdTech summit was an advantage for the team because I know how African educators teach in the class. The majority of them use the same teaching methods and the goal is to shift from the from that um, same teaching skill and use technology because it seems like technology is taking over, taking over the world. But the concern now is a lot of teachers are afraid of using technology because they think that technology is um, replacing them in a way. And what they don't know is that technology is there to improve learning and the, their role is still important because if they are not in class, who will teach the kids how to use the technology? So that's why I said summit is there for, for them to, to be empowered and basically learn how to use these devices and then um, teach their children. So I'm um, traveling with uh, people from different parts of the world was the major was the greatest opportunity for me because um, we shared a lot of cultural differences. Um, we shared about our struggles in classes. We shared about the possible solutions that we can um, that we can we can take and and use. So, and a lot of people that I traveled with, I'm still in contact with them. So, if 
I lost contact with them. I wasn't connected here to this because I'm only here because of um Karen Bambeck and the matching thing here for there. So after the summit, I received a lot of emails from people telling me that they enjoyed using the tools and they want to, to, to get more online tools. So I suggested that um, maybe next year in January, I'll take a few of my colleagues and then we'll go around um, training other teachers from different schools because um, a lot of teachers right now are receiving tablets, not just the teachers, but um, the students as well. And I believe they need that person training and I can do that for free. And yeah. So the South African education system is changing for the better. A lot of public schools right now are using tablets. Um, like I said, I just want to, to make sure that um, the, the, the education system of South Africa is changing because a lot of people here in South Africa don't take education seriously, especially the, the young generation. They, they, after, they, are, they are all after the money. They say teaching them with money. So, yeah, that's me presenting at um, Swaziland. I'll just move quickly and do the pictures and then open up all the questions. So that's me and the students in Pumalanga. Um, that's the whole team and the students in Pumalanga. Um, Swaziland. Swaziland. And I edited this picture and wrote Agent of Change because after every session, like a lot of teachers came to us um, saying that we've changed their perspective of using technology, we've changed how they view education and a lot of things. So that's why I renamed this picture and um, I wrote Agent of Change. Um, here we're in Cape Town. This was before the workshop started. Um, I'll just slide through, and this was a gold window in Pumalanga. Um, it's a beautiful view, and you can see another country from here. So, from Pumalanga, we we're able to see uh, Mozambique, which is another African country. And yeah, thank you. Um, we we'll now open for questions and. You can ask about our experience or the exit summit in general. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kevin and Karen. And um, to everyone who's still with us in the chat room, um, I hope you've enjoyed listening and have a little bit of a flavor of what EdTech Summit is like for both uh, the presentation team and hopefully for the attendees. Um, I'd like to answer a couple of questions that came to us, and we're reading the chat room. Please, please uh, ask any other questions there, um, and and we'll um, we'll get to it. So Kevin, we'll get to. There's one for you there in a minute, but let me just address a couple that were in there. Um, Peggy asked earlier why uh, I mentioned that they're they're low risk, low stakes, and what I was referring to was if a conference is free, and if teacher participants can walk up and make their own choices about what to attend, not be led by what their school wants them to attend. If it's free, that means there's very little uh, expectation that they that the school puts on them for proving that they've learned something by bringing it back and changing which is often times the case with teachers who attend conferences uh, that their schools or districts have paid for. Um, so they come and they make choices and then um, we believe in sort of the risk taking leads to deeper learning and we make that evident in every um, session that we give. So it's okay to make mistakes and no one's watching over your shoulder and as a matter of fact we laugh together and sometimes those mistakes end up being uh, major takeaways as, as many teachers know. So that's what I meant by low risk, low stakes, that we, it would be much easier on us to manage a conference where everybody signed up in advance. Um, but that choice of what to attend and then 
you know, not having the expectation of proving the learning has been a big one. And then um, on funding, we raise funds in the U.S. Um, so far, we haven't found South African partners. Um, the whole conference is produced uh, uh, three weeks, ten locations, three countries, uh, was produced for under $50,000, and that's, that's you know, um, we get a lot of, of our, the schools offering us uh, facilities, but we pay for catering, we pay for travel, and the volunteers pay for their own transport to um, and from Africa, but every Everything else is, is, is paid for by our budget. And, and it's very hard to raise funds here. Um, but we, f we feel like it um, benefits the teachers who join us. Now we're over 50, over four years. They come back to their US and European and Asian schools and bring a lot of their learnings back. And then our, our um, African teachers uh, as well are learning from attending the conference. Um, and then finally, before I turn it over to Kevin with his question, um, Julie M. asked a question about sustaining um, PLNs and engagement in professional learning networks. And those of you who have been a part of one or who especially who have run one uh, know that this is the hardest piece of it, is not to let it fall sort of uh, um, passive and for it to remain active and to get a lot of, of people contributing. Um, we actually had maybe 10% of the people contributing, responding to various pieces, share, new sharings we put in. But we, we, we launched a poll to say, listen, is this not working for everybody? Are you, as an administrator, I could see how many people, 200 people might look at a post, but only four commented. And um, everyone that answered that poll said, please don't take this away. We look at it. We see it. We don't have time to comment or we don't have connectivity. Uh, so, so sometimes measuring that engagement and measuring that um, the benefits is, is, is more nuanced. Um, so, so we continue. Um, but it is a, one of the biggest struggles. Uh, thanks for asking the question, and I can talk more about that with you if you want to connect with me outside of the conference. Um, Kevin, you had a, uh, I think Lucy asked a question for you. Do you see your question and want to? Yeah, I can see my in? question here. Yeah. Um, Lucy, um, none of my teachers use technology when I was growing up, and the reason why I, I'm using technology right now is because I want to be the teacher that I never had. And I basically love the online, the three online tools that uh, like are engaging. So learners, um, especially game-based learning, I love using Kahoot because it's it's fun and a lot of a lot of kids like love that love playing games. So Kahoot is one of the fun online tools that every teacher can use. Great. Karen, um, be put in, I think someone asked, oh, from Peggy, how much um, access to technology is an issue with your teachers? Uh, it's a huge issue. It is the biggest issue is lack of connectivity or lack of education officials uh, uh, prioritizing connectivity. If I um, have prioritized a library and filling a library and I'm in rural South Africa or Ghana, um, by the time a kid gets to go in and check a book to find out who's the current president of France or what is what are the latest UN you know charter resolutions, then um, that kid has to check you know a textbook or a book that's already out of date out of date. So at our conference, we do a lot of leadership sessions. We really try and push connectivity even on one computer in a library is better than no connectivity at all. And we show how that's possible by traveling with our own routers, our own connectivity. We've done various um, experiments over the years. But that's a big part of our budget is traveling with connectivity. Um, we've had schools give away routers and access points so that we set schools up over there. But we always show them that it's possible, even if it's every Friday is an online day, um, to, to, to get online and ideally 
we show them how having Google in your pocket uh, helps kids to learn further. So, but it, but it is, um, it's going to change. It's changed just in the last few years when we've gone from flip phones to almost everyone that we deal with has a smartphone. They may be on a pay-as-you-go data plan, but, um, but uh, connectivity is a human right now. I, I firmly believe that like water and food and shelter, um, having access to the online resources of the world now that education has gone so open source and sharing um, is, is a right that has to happen. And if you are not connected, you stay on one side of the digital divide uh, and, and, and you don't have the same opportunities for self-directed learning, for improvement, for climbing out of um, uh, uh, struggling situations, for geographic restrictions. Um, so I feel like every school should be connected somehow, some way, um, as a start. Karen B., you want to uh, jump in here? Um, I'm not sure, Karen. Uh, I'm having connectivity issues, uh, so okay. I'm worried about taxing my system. Uh, okay. Yeah, it was fascinating that everyone had a phone, but a lot of people said they didn't have computers, and a lot of people said they don't have computers. Okay. I'm here. Can you not hear me? Now we can. Hello? Yep, Karen, we can hear you. Oh, man. Well, I was trying to say that every everyone seemed to have a phone. Okay. But I did hear okay, but I did hear that a lot of teachers didn't have computers uh, in their classrooms, or Wi-Fi was only in the main office. They didn't have Wi-Fi in their classrooms. Uh, so it just seems kind of, you know, terribly tragic, but hopeful that we were teaching teachers how to use technology and how to embrace productivity and creativity and communication enhancements, you know, mostly with Google, but with any online tool that's free and collaborative. And we're, we're showing them all these tips and tricks, but the reality is they didn't have necessarily the infrastructure at their school to use them, but they felt compelled to feel a little more, they, they said that they were a little more empowered to talk with their school leaders about how they could use these tools if they did have these tools. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I was hoping that we could develop advocates, and, and, and as, as Kevin said, we were kind of like encouraging, we, I felt like an agent of change, but I felt like I was working with teachers who were basically also agents of change for their communities. Yeah, exactly. Uh, helping to foster teacher leaders within schools is a, a huge part of, you know, what we're trying to do without specifically teaching leadership. We're trying to, um, you know, imbue confidence and a love of learning and, and, and a, a way to break down the fear of technology. And we're also pointing out that, you know, you have a computer if you have a phone. These days, you have a computer if you have a phone. And these days, uh, you can teach yourself anything um, if you are connected, if you, if you have data. Uh, and Karen mentioned Project Isisway. Um, it's a nonprofit company in South Africa that's committed to spreading free Wi-Fi zones all through Africa. They're actually working with Facebook right now in, uh, and unfortunately had a satellite on, um, one of the, the, uh, the, the Elon Musk's um, uh, satellite installation that was supposed to go up uh, that unfortunately crashed. But um, now community centers on top of buses, um, there are access points in, in South Africa set up a model in Pretoria. It's called uh, Tshwane. And, and on all buses and community centers, people have access, and they're, they're using their phones uh, to learn. Uh, if they watch a movie, it's spooled, and no, they don't have to stream it again because it's spooled on, on, on servers there. And so obviously entertainment is there with connectivity, but learning, and again, I'll mention self-directed learning, is, is huge and is key and is a way of moving through education that we really want. You know, we want to 
foster critical inquiry and discovery. And we have to do that by helping people move away from a lecture-driven society and, and into project-based learning and into experiential learning and learning by doing. Um, yeah, as Pam, as Peggy says, taking charge of their own learning. That's, you know, that's something that, that gets learned uh, and, and you become addicted to learning. It's taking one more course. It's, it's getting off from school and continuing to read something that was introduced to school, in school. So we're showing teachers that this can happen. Uh, and Kevin's a perfect example of, you know, coming out of a very lecture-driven um, elementary school education and moving into a high school that brought in many, many more projects and many, many more sort of hands-on learning opportunities. And then he, he exposed himself to a lot of technology, was able to take part in a, in a U.S. program through Teach with Africa and the Global Teachers Institute in South Africa, and is now bringing all of that into his, his teaching. And, um, you know, Karen and I uh, do that as well when we're working with students. Um, advocacy is not a formal part of our, our program. Um, great question, uh, Peggy, but we, uh, we write, we blog, we um, invite people to come to our conference who, are, who, who can affect education, and um, we've developed some relationships uh, that way. Um, working with teacher educators in higher ed, there is a need for that, um, uh, and we're doing that. I mean, we had three universities partner with us um, this, this last uh, 2016, and Karen Blumberg and I are both affiliated with Teachers College. Um, so, uh, but this conference, EdTech Summit Africa, is specifically and purposefully agile so that we can actually partner more with our attendees and iterate and build so that we can change faster and serve our population. Um, we're learning from universities, um, but we can't afford to, to move at a university's pace of change. Um, so I will say that I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the university I'm involved in, um, but, but we need to be able to change fast in the field as technology is changing. You know, this is a changing business. Karen, Kevin, any last words? No, I don't think anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I'm not sure, maybe Karen Blumberg has some, uh, some, some connection problems over there. But we do invite everybody and anybody to reach out to us, stay connected with us. If it's something that you'd like to try, be in contact with me or join our program one year. Um, and thanks, uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, and thank you Kevin. We're so happy to have you here, and we hope that you'll stay involved with the GEC. And I just want to tell you that you're more than welcome to post in our discussion forum any time of the year about any opportunities or things that you're doing or requests that you have. Um, and anything we can do to support you, is, it would be great. Um, one of our longtime presenters here, Richard Close, is somebody that you should probably talk to because he's worked in Africa. I think he's already mentioned that. And I'm sure there are other people who would, who would be fascinated by your model and how it could be used in other places to, you know, effectively and authentically um, reach more educators. So we're, we're really thrilled that you were here and, and it was great to learn about this and we'll be following your work. Thank you. Great. great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Kevin from South Africa for joining us. <laughs> Thanks to everyone in the chat room. <laughs> what time right. is it? <laughs> Kevin, what it's, time is it? It's 9, it's 9 p.m. right now. I think you need to go home and rest now. So thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you going the extra mile. We really do. Stay in touch. Thank you. Bye. Bye.